Thank you for joining us for this evening's event. My name is Jeremy Garber, and I'm the events coordinator for PALS Books. Before we begin, I wanted to encourage you to check out our lineup of upcoming virtual events by visiting our website at pals.com. One of the many great events we're looking forward to is Daniel Krauss in conversation with Mary Roach on August 4th. Krauss completed George A. Romero's novel, The Living Dead, after his passing in 2017. So if you like dead bodies, be sure to register for that one. As well, please consider following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And if you haven't already done so, please sign up for our weekly events email at pals.com. Tonight, we're honored to welcome Paul Tremblay and Jeremy Robert Johnson. Uh, Paul Tremblay is the Bram Stoker, British fantasy and Massachusetts book award-winning author of Growing Things, The Cabin at the End of the World, Disappearance at Devil's Rock, A Head Full of Ghosts, and the crime novels The Little Sleep and No Sleep Till Wonderland. He is currently a member of the board of directors of the Shirley Jackson Awards, and his essays in short fiction have appeared in the Los Angeles Times, Entertainment Weekly Online, and numerous Year's Best Anthologies. He has a master's degree in mathematics and lives outside Boston with his family. In the uncertain and frightening era of COVID-19, Tremblay's new novel, Survivor Song, presciently mirrors the anxiety, chaos, and grief leveled by a fast-moving pandemic. The story opens on a Massachusetts rapidly overrun by an insidious rabies-like virus that is spread by saliva. The outbreak quickly rises to a full-blown catastrophe for the city in just a matter of weeks. But unlike rabies, the disease has a terrifyingly short incubation period of an hour or less. Those infected quickly lose their minds and are driven to bite and infect as many others as they can before they inevitably succumb. Hospitals are inundated with the sick and dying and hysteria has taken hold. To try to limit its spread, the Commonwealth is under quarantine and curfew, but even still, the government's emergency protocols are faltering. With Survivor Song, Tremblay once again demonstrates his mastery with a chilling and all too plausible novel that will surely leave you racing through the pages and shaken to your core. As the New York Times has said of him, Tremblay doesn't just hold a mirror up to reality, but live streams it, projecting the whole spectrum of our modern anxieties so vividly, it feels as if we're watching in real time. Tremblay is joined in conversation tonight by Jeremy Robert Johnson. Johnson is the author of the critically acclaimed collection, Entropy and Bloom, as well as the breakthrough cult novel, Skull Crack City. His fiction has been praised by the Washington Post and Publishers Weekly, by authors such as David Wong, Chuck Palahniuk, and Jack Ketchum, and has appeared internationally in numerous anthologies and magazines. In 2008, he worked with the Mars Volta to tell the story behind their Grammy-winning album, The Bedlam in Goliath. And in 2017, his short story, When Sussurus Stirs, was adapted for film and won numerous awards, including the Final Frame Grand Prize and Best Short Film at the HP Lovecraft Film Festival. This evening's event also includes an audience Q&A, so please be sure to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen if you'd like to ask a question. As well, if someone has typed a question that you'd also like to know the answer to, please consider upvoting that particular question by clicking the thumbs up button. Most importantly, please consider supporting both Pal, Pals and Paul by purchasing a copy of his new book, Survivor Song. A link to buy the book will be shared a couple times in the chat this evening. Paul, Jeremy, it's an honor to welcome you both today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's an honor to be here. Um, I guess I'm just going to jump right in and read for like five minutes, right? Sounds good. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I can't, there's not a lot of places from the book that I feel like I can read from without getting too spoilery, so I apologize if some people have heard this before, but this is from um, from the, the introductory chapter, or, or what I call the prelude. Um, so what you need to know is Natalie is eight and a half months pregnant. She's home alone, you know, waiting for her husband, Paul, to come back from the grocery store, um, you know, during, during this outbreak of the rabies virus. Her husband, Paul, is now home, and they're sort of arguing, discussing, what should they do? Should they leave the house? Should they try to go somewhere? What Paul says next is an echo of a conversation from 10 days ago. We should have driven to your parents' place as soon as it started getting bad. We should go now. Paul, we can't, Natalie says. Why not? We're under federal quarantine. They won't let us leave. We need to try. So what are we going to do? Drive down 95 into Rhode Island, just like that? Natalie isn't arguing with him. She really isn't. 
She agrees they are indeed in big trouble and they can't stay. She doesn't want to stay and she doesn't want to go to an emergency shelter or an overburdened hospital. She's arguing with Paul in the hope one of them will stumble upon a solution. We can't stay here, Natalie. We have to try something. She says, what if they arrest us? We might get separated. You were just telling me how crazy it was at Star Market. You think it's any better on the highways or at the state borders? We'll find some open back roads. Natalie nods, but says, maybe we're at the worst point now. I didn't even tell you there was a fox staggering in the middle of the Washington corner intersection like it was drunk, and a fucking dole right at my front tire. Maybe the quarantine will help get the spread of the illness under control. Everyone will be all right as long as we don't. Natalie continues talking, even though there's the unmistakable sound of footsteps on their gravel driveway. She's lived in the house long enough to know the difference between the sustained crunch and mash of car tires, the light maraca-like patter of squirrels and cats, the allegro rush of paws from the neighbor's dog, a goofy Rhodesian ridgeback the size of a small horse, and the percussive gait of a person. The steps are hurried, quickly approaching the house, yet the rhythm is all wrong. The rhythm is broken. There's a grinding lunge, a lurch, two heavy steps, then a hitching correction, and a stagger, and a drag. Someone or something crashes into the propped open gate and bellows out three loud barks. After the initial shock, Natalie all but melts with relief, believing, or wanting to believe. What she hears is, in fact, Casey the dog. Shock turns to worry. She wonders why Casey would be out on her own. Natalie turns and she cranes her head and looks out the front door and through the porch. A large upright blur passes by the small row of screened windows. The barks return and they're more like expectorating coughs. There is a man standing less than 10 feet away from her. He opens the screen door and says in a dry, scratchy, but clear baritone, fall came and it began to rain, left out in the cold and rain. Then he grunts. <laughs> Natalie and Paul yell at the man to go away. They shout questions and directions to each other. The white man is large, over six feet tall, and closer to 300 pounds than he is to 200. He wears dirty jeans and a long sleeve t-shirt advertising a local brewery. He steps through the door and fills their porch. With each coughing bark, he bends and contorts, and then his body snaps back into an unnatural rigidity. He points and reaches toward Natalie and Paul. Natalie can only see the shape and contour of the man's face as he's silhouetted by the dim daylight behind him. Natalie's fear morphs into a self-preservation shade of rage. Her fists clench and she steps forward and yells, get the fuck off our porch. Paul moves more nimbly and darts in front of Natalie. He swings the front door shut with enough force to rattle the frame. Whoa. His hand momentarily loses contact with the doorknob and he is not able to get the door locked before the man is already forcing it back open. Natalie! Paul shouts her name as though it's a question, a question that is not rhetorical yet has no answer. The door swings open, forcing Paul back into the house. The bottoms of his sneakers squeak as they slide over the wooden floor. Paul bends his legs, lowers a shoulder, attempting to gain purchase to find the leverage he has lost forever. His feet stop sliding and they tangle, tripping him up. Paul falls onto his knees and the fiberglass door sweeps him away. And I'm just gonna read one paragraph um, from much deeper into the book. Um, like I said, it's one paragraph. The virus doesn't herald the end of the world or of the United States or even of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. In the coming days, conditions will continue to deteriorate. Emergency services and other public safety nets will be stretched to their breaking points exacerbated by the wily antagonists of fear, panic, misinformation, a myopic sluggish federal bureaucracy, further hamstrung by a president unwilling and woefully unequipped to make the rational science-based decisions necessary, and exacerbated, of course, by plain old individual everyday evil. But there will be many heroes too, including ones who don't view themselves as such. All right. Bring Jeremy back. Jeremy. <laughs> hey, hey, Paul. Hey, hey, how you doing? Good. Um, I think we can. I think we can jump right into it. Thanks for reading. All right. Sure. Thanks for listening. Um, let's see. So, uh, first, I wanted to uh, say thank you to Pals 
for hosting this event. Um, Paul is one of my favorite modern writers of literary horror. Um, I'm kind of pointing at him where he is in his little <laughs> square, like it's the Brady Bunch, but I'm not sure if he yeah. shows up the on everybody's <laughs> screen. There's a tiny Paul by my right hand. Um, it's an honor to have this conversation with him and to uh, help him watch this eerily prescient and haunting outbreak novel uh, in Survivor Song. I'm excited to get into the conversation and find out more about the genesis of the novel. So um, here we go. All right. So, well, thank you. Honored to be with you, Jeremy. I mean, you're one of my favorites as well. And we'll, we'll talk you. a little bit about your book coming in the fall, The Loop, which is amazing. <laughs> um, so it's becoming common knowledge that Paul Tremblay novels merge traditional horror elements with very careful immersive character studies. And one of the end results of that technique is that you'll end up caring about the character before they meet their awful fate which further means that your books make people cry. Um, is it always your intent, as with Survivor Song section titled Interlude, to include a scene which will make people cry? And as a follow-up, have you ever made yourself cry during the writing process? Um, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, I don't know, it's super gratifying to hear when, when people say they get, you know, emotionally invested in, in the story. Um, I don't know if I try to make people cry, but, you know, in a weird way, I feel like I can be in more control of emotions, like strong emotions that way, as opposed to if something is scary or not, because I don't know what's scary to you or to somebody else. It's so subjective, but I feel like I can at least make things like emotionally difficult <laughs> for the characters. And maybe, you know, maybe that's a little bit more universal. I don't know. Um, you know, when I'm in that, when I'm actually writing something, you know, the, I can see the gear. So I don't use, I don't get affected. I mean, if I, to me, that's the hardest time, like in the middle of writing, of knowing if, or hope, you know, if knowing, I shouldn't even say knowing, thinking that something might be effective, whether scary or emotional or something like that. Um, but I will say, since you asked, <laughs> um, after, you know, after finishing Disappearance of Devil's Rock, um, you know, and then going through the edits, like it, in that book, it's funny, my editor took like a few months, so there was a few months in between reading it. I got to forget about the book for a little while. But uh, so after taking like a couple months off of reading the book, when I read the very last chapter with Elizabeth, um, you know, that, I don't know, that got to me a little bit. I mean, I, of all the characters, I don't know, that I've written, I feel like, you know, she hits me in the heart the most, I think. Yeah, that tracks, that tracks. <laughs> that tracks. Well, it's, it's one of only five scenes, you know, I've, I've said this often before, but it's one of only five scenes that ever made me actually, I'll feel intensely with a book. Um, yeah. I'll be along for the ride, but to actually get it here, I mean, and I'll cry at commercials left and right. You know, somebody hugs in a commercial, it's waterworks. I'm super sensitive to that kind of stuff. But for with, with yeah. books, it's only happened five times. And the final chapter of uh, Disappearance is one of those times. Like you, you don't, you don't yeah. forget. Well, thank you. Because it's such a strange thing to be just holding a big chunk of paper <laughs> and crying. <laughs> it doesn't make sense, yeah. but there, there it is. Um, so in the past, uh, you've stated that some of your books have kind of very clear film analogs or inspirations. Uh, for example, Disappearance at Devil's Rock is heavily influenced by Picnic at Hanging Rock and Snowtown and Lake Mungo. Um, mm -hmm. You described Survivor Song as a zombie adjacent novel, but there are some <laughs> moments like the Dawn of the Dead remake-esque opening sequence that show a clear film influence on the work. Um, were there other zombie or outbreak influences on this novel? Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to do anything related to zombie without like film, especially sort of creeping in. Um, I mean, I started off though trying to do to some things a little bit differently. Like I knew I didn't want to do, um, I, I wanted to do like a, a smaller story with only two characters really that you get their point of view as opposed to you know, the cast of thousands type of book or type of movie that have all been done very well, but I just didn't feel like, didn't feel like it's a strength of mine for one thing. Um, and I also wanted to make sure people re realize, you know, this isn't the end of the world. And to me, that sort of makes it more poignant and maybe even tragic for some of the characters to don't make it. Like if they could have just held out for a month or something, you know, then, then maybe they would have been okay. Um, I don't know, so otherwise it was like little bits here and there from films. Um, without getting spoilery, there's, there's, a, there's a white farmhouse that appears in the book at some point. And that's definitely, I was thinking of, of you know, Night of the Living Dead. Um, yeah. that, that was certainly purposeful. Um, otherwise, like something like the interlude, which you just happened to mention, 
that, that came from, you know, totally unrelated zombie stuff. Um, Patrick DeWitt's one of my favorite writers. He did the Sisters Brothers, Major Domo Minor. Uh, very funny and dark books. And mo most recently, um, oh, shoot, French Exit. Very funny book. Anyway, in mo uh, Major Domo Minor, the whole book is from this one sort of loser character's point of view, except in the middle, there's this interlude where you, and it's a very emotional, quirky little piece that lets you catch up on a couple other characters before you go back to hundreds of more pages with this other character. And I always was like, oh, I want to try to do something like that at some point. I just sort of filed that away. So that was part of where um, some of what, what I was thinking about for the interlude um, in, in this book. It was, it was funny because the interlude section in Survivor Song actually made me go back and read a portion of Disappearance. Um, oh, really? <laughs> I, yeah, I, I wanted to to refresh things that were being alluded to within that story and within that universe because um, it had been a couple years, and and actually found it was it was even more resonant kind of reading those sections back to back. And so, um, if people haven't read Disappearance oh, yet, it it does enrich your experience it's not necessary at all for survivor right. song that story not is its own story but it definitely enriches it which is which is interesting um nice. so the the language patterns of the characters who become infected with the super rabies virus in your novel have this kind of eerie sing-song quality um when they speak how did you come up with that sort of language of the infected so you know I didn't read the first paragraph of the book. Maybe I probably should have, but a couple times, you know, I say, this is, this is not a fairy tale. This is a song, uh, especially when we have like the interlude, no, prelude, interlude, postlude. I have to always remember the order in my head. Um, you know, the title of the book is obviously Survivor Song, but you know, some of that was me just like tweaking a little bit, like, cause I, I, I end up referencing a lot of fairy tale stuff, Grimm's fairy tales, I should say in particular. Um, you know, and even, in the design of the book, the, my publisher, and they did an amazing job of, of making those three sections sort of look storybookish. Um, but for the, you know, for the people who succumb to the rabies virus, you know, again, they're, you know, they're not rise from the dead zombies, they're infected people and the rabies virus just basically just, you know, set your brain on fire essentially. So they're saying words. Um, and, Everything an infected person says is, are actually lines from Grimm's fairy tales. They're actually, you know, some of them are garbled a little bit, but for the most part, like in that prelude, you know, some of the stuff that I read was, you know, playing with, um, playing with the big bad wolf, uh, Three Little Pigs. Um, later on, there's a bit where someone is saying lines from, um, shoot, what was it? It's been a while since I wrote it, uh, uh, Rapunzel. So. I know, it's just a little bit of way of like tweaking a little bit like, oh, you know, actually there is some references to fairy tales, but the story itself is certainly not a Disney style fairy tale. It is sort of no. much closer to a Grimm style fairy tale. <laughs> it was it was interesting, I think, because it almost kind of expresses um, having them have linguistic similarities makes it feel like elements of of the pandemic are manifesting, you know, mentally almost in a collective way. Um, versus just each person's brain on fire, the kind of gibberish each different person would turn out with, with brain damage and, and inflammation. Having it be that kind of um, meter and those kind of archaic references made it feel um, a little more ominous. I thought, I thought it was an interesting technique. Um, Thank you. So since the book came out, you caught some, some internet flack uh, for Survivor Song's negative attitude towards conspiracy theories, gun crazy <laughs> militia groups, and ineffective government responses. Um, how does it feel to be the first person who's ever inserted a political point of view into a horror novel? And uh, <laughs> do, you, do you stand by Natalie and Ram's assertions in the book? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, just like everything that's going on in this country, it's, it's frustrating. It, it's, it's still like, in, I have a hard time understanding how, you know, people could still vote for Trump. Could like listen to it, just like listen to him speak for a few seconds or or, you know, and I'm still continually, even though I've read books and books about conspiracy theories and sort of their, um, there was one book that came out a few years ago called Republic of Lies that I thought was very fascinating. And Colin Dickey is a wonderful writer. He just he did a book called Ghostland a few years ago that was about hauntings. It was really about the history of these hauntings. Anyway, he has a new book called, um, oh, what's it called? The Unin, 
the Onion something. I'm sorry, I'm terrible with titles. But Colin Dickey has a book, and some of it's about conspiracy theories and just how they grow, and you know, obviously how the internet is just turbocharged. Not only the conspiracy theories themselves, but the mainstreaming of it, how many people believe in it. So, I don't know, I, I always try to write books about now. Like, I want people who read them now for the, uh, these books are supposed to feel like now. So, how do I not put that stuff in there, you know? Um, as far as Rams and Nats, I feel like I'm a, sort of a combo. <laughs> uh, like, some of their personality traits are sort of like, a, you know, they're sort of like my one shoulder and the other shoulder that I argue with myself frequently. Um, I don't know if you're, yeah, I guess you're probably referencing maybe early on, there's a discussion between Rams and Natalie, like when they were friends in college about how easy it would be for like an apocalypse or for this, or for society to collapse. Like, um, geez, I can't remember. No, Natalie was like, oh yeah, it'd be so easy for it to collapse. And Ramil was like, you know, you know, there's, you actually know, like it's a lot, society is a lot more resilient, you know, save like a comet or an asteroid landing on this kind of thing. So I don't know, I, rationally I'm on Ram's side, but like my lizard brain, which controls most of my life and controls most of our life, I probably shade more toward Natalie. So you mentioned Rams and Nats kind of representing different sides of your approach to it. What about Paul, the dead husband in the beginning? Because I thought that was kind of, to me, on a meta level, everybody always fantasizes themselves, you know, as the, the cipher in these zombie novels as, oh, I'm the one that would make it through and make the right decisions oh, yeah. and be rational and et cetera, et cetera. So it, I just kind of found it funny that the, the first character to go, you know, does his best and then just dies, you know? He's like, I, I tried, you know? Um, was that intentional or um, just uh, something that popped up? Um, yeah, no, a little bit intentional. It, it's just something like, uh, my friend Laird Barron, who's a great writer, um, always talks about like he puts stuff in that he thinks people will get upset about and makes them laugh or he does something shocking. And I, I enjoy like imagining Laird like laughing behind the keyboard. And when I put myself like name the husband after me and killed him, I, I, I must say I had a sort of a chuckle at that. But, he, that, that, yeah. but he's, uh, he's only 5'10 and I'm 6'4. Um, there you so go. That's we're not quite the same. <laughs> but no, I have been doing terrible things to people who are characters who either have my name or look like me in my books recently. So I don't know. Um, shoot, there's something else I was going to say somewhat related to that. It's gone. Gone. Damn it. Oh, um, Paul's fate in this book, like, totally ended up mirroring reality because in March, when we were first, you know, obviously he didn't get killed, but when, when, I first, when we first went into quarantine in Massachusetts in March, um, it sort of coincided, or it, it happened to coincide with my two weeks off from school. And during those two weeks, like, I was like in a literal and metaphorical um, fetal position just on the couch watching Animal Planet and Mythbusters because I just couldn't deal. So, yeah, I, I'm not, I, I am not prepared for the zombie apocalypse in the least. <laughs> um, so, throughout the book, uh, Natalie is recording an audio journal for her unborn child. Uh, and that's one of the devices through which the story is told and, and through which we really connect more to Natalie's past and her relationship to her future and her child. Um, so in one of the recordings, she indicates that her lucky number is 19. Um, given that this is an uncommon number and one with great significance to the constant readers of Stephen King's work, um, was this meant as a low-key allusion to the Dark Tower mythos? And I've gotten that question so many times, and I, I wish it was. Um, even though I, I've read The Dark Tower and I've enjoyed it, I just don't remember stuff like that. Um, so no, I, that just happens to be, for whatever reason, one of my favorite numbers, with, with no rhyme or no reason to it. Except maybe oh, cause yeah. a wheel, so maybe... Right, right? so you're, you're not blaming... <laughs> so maybe it is, yeah. You're just you're bringing his mythos into your larger mythos now. You're just right. going to grab a hold of it and be like, oh yeah, that's, that's happening yeah. here too. Yeah, he won't mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that um, whole chapter, that whole chapter about the beam, he was fine. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, without getting into any spoilers, uh, don't want to make any, anybody nervous, but Survivor Song is your first novel, which does not end on a note of deep ambiguity. And that's, that's all I'll say about that. Um, yeah. It could have had a much debated, like, Lady and the Tiger finish if you'd not included the postlude section. Right. Um, what is it that you love about ambiguity in fiction, and what made you decide to have your first direct ending with Survivor Song? 
Um, well, some of it, well, some of like, I, I didn't want to, I, uh, let, me, let me, I'm stumbling through here. So the last three novels are all sort of like before this one, Head Full of Ghosts, Disappearance of Devil's Rock, and Cam at the End of the World. I sort of like how they fit together thematically, how all three were about families in crisis, and all three use varying, um, le I won't say levels, but you know, they vary the, the idea of the supernatural amb ambiguous element. And I know I can't do that forever as much as I am, am drawn to that kind of story. And my editor agreed, you know, she's like, yeah, you know, <laughs> even though she calls me Mr. Ambiguous Horror from time to time. Although now she started calling me Mr. Sad Horror in line with your earlier question. <laughs> um, so no, I was definitely looking for a story that wasn't, you know, wouldn't sort of lean on ambiguity. But that said, if I had, if I had had a story idea where it worked, I would have. Um, I try to, I don't want to force anything. You know, I want it to be what it needs to be. You know, I'd only add something ambiguous to something if I thought it served the story, if it was part of the theme. Um, so yeah, so when I had the idea for the story, I knew, um, I'd had similar questions where a few people have asked me, hey, did you always have the postlude in mind? Or did you end it where you, or was there an ending and then you added the postlude afterward? And I was like, no, the postlude was always, you know, some form of it, not word for word, was always there for me. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I knew I, I kind of wanted to fake an ambiguous ending <laughs> just to piss off some people. <laughs> but uh, it was funny. This time I've had a few people say, hey, you know, uh, I kind of wish you left the post loot off. I wanted that ambiguous ending. I'm like, what? You can't win. <laughs> you can't yeah. win with that. <laughs> um, so, so you built Survivor Song around a musical structure, including the sections like the interlude and the postlude. If you could choose one band on earth to adapt Survivor song into an actual piece of music which band would that be and would it have to be a long form prog album um no it would not have to be a long form prog album um i mean am i allowed to pick any band that's existed because i'm wearing my favorite band of all time who should do and actually this album's in arcade you know a punk band it's a it's a double album concept album about a kid who runs away from home and finds that like life outside is worse than, than it was at home so yeah i you know i would Love a who's could do who's could do Zen Arcade style Survivor song that would be unreal. Because my son. So with um with both Survivor song and Cabin at the End of the World, there seems to be this um, running theme that says kind of suffering is inherent in life, and we're headed into dark times. And though hope and kindness may not alleviate suffering, they allow us to exist in a kind of grace. Um, what is it in 2020? that makes you want to extol the virtues of hope? Oh boy. Well, I wrote this book before 2020, so I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, so, I mean, we get frustrated. You know, the part that I try to remind myself, especially now, all of us are online all the time. So you're just bombarded with doom scrolling, negative news. You know, and I, actually, you know what I mean by negative news? I mean bad news. Like, I'm not saying like it's a negative slant. Um, I don't know. It's hard to remind yourself that, you know, there is, you know, there are people who are good and kind and doing the best they, you know, doing the best that they can. Uh, I take great hope in like my, my kids' generations, some of the Gen Z kids, you know, seeing, you know, and having taken my daughter to a bunch of protests and see how active she is. Um, you know, I get hope from that. I get hope from, you know, my sister as frustrated as she is and as, already emotionally scarred as she is, you know, as a big city nurse and, you know, helping everyone, you know, becoming an ICU nurse in, in an hour, you know, hour training, you know, she would never done the ICU before, uh, the kind of stuff that people do. So, you know, it's hard. It's just, you know, I don't know. I mean, to me, I've said before, I mean, it, it seems like small consolation when you're living in obviously a, an extra sort of scary time. Like, well, all, all, every time that anyone has ever lived has been scary, but it seems a little bit scarier now. Um, like with me, punk music and horror, I feel like where they overlap is both of those sort of trade in telling a, a, a truth. Like a horror story reveals a truth. A punk song to me reveals a truth. And usually the truth is bad. It's a terrible truth. It's, you know, something social, personal, universal. You know, it's not like good news. It's like, ah, you know, there's something terribly wrong. But I find hope in the recognition, the shared recognition that yes, there is something terribly wrong. You know, hopefully we can overcome it. But even if we don't, I don't know, I, I find value in the recognition. 
Okay. I'm um, everybody down. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's a great answer. Um, uh, kind of separating from the new novel for a moment and looking at your broader work, uh, so far you've given us a take on exorcisms, hauntings, home invasions, and now a zombie outbreak. Um, the news recently dropped that you have a new multi-book deal with William Morrow, and your next novel will be The Pallbearers Club, due out in stores in 2022. Um, mm -hmm. What are you allowed to tell us about the book, and what kind of story are you ripping on this time? <laughs> um, so it's funny, like, I, I, I came up with the idea for this book, I would say, in the fall, but I let it sort of roll around. Like, the fall of 2019, I started thinking about this idea for this book. Um, and some of its appeal was honestly, after writing Cabin and Survivor Song, both of which lean so heavily into the anxieties of life in Trumplandia, essentially. Like if I'm gonna describe both books. Um, you know, so this book, to me, I felt like I was gonna, you know, that'll still leak in somehow into a book, but this book was gonna start back in 1988. It was gonna be a lot, it's gonna be a lot more personal it's going to be written as sort of like a faux memoir uh, of a, I don't know, sort of a hopefully a humorous, lovable loser kind of character, um, using a lot of autobiographical stuff as a starting point of this kid in high school. And I, I, in some ways, it's almost like it becomes like an alternate path of what I could have gone on. Um, so it, it starts off this weird memoir of this high school kid who um, he... You know, he's desperate to leave town because you know he has no friends. He hates you know he hates his high school classmates. You know, super shy, etc. And he says, "Well, like I, you know, he sort of realizes late in the game, it's like I need some extracurriculars. My grades are pretty good, but like I get nothing. I don't play sports. I don't do this. Don't. So he comes up with this idea to start the Paul Bearers Club, which is you know he and whoever he can get to go with him would volunteer at a local funeral home to." Um, attend services for homeless or for elderly people who don't have a lot of friends and family that will attend. Yeah, so it's kind of been like a so kind of weird. At the same um yeah so he there's a at some point there's a woman who joins who's a little bit odd and, and she becomes like this figure throughout the rest of his life. So the book sort of spans from like 1988 onward. Um, uh -oh. Is it going to have sharks in it? Oh, man. Does anybody else have a frozen fall? Oh, perhaps. Hey there. Sorry about that. Oh, OK. Uh, Where did I freeze? It was a pregnant was pause. My, my <laughs> my publisher, my publisher, the plug, they didn't want me to say anymore. <laughs> oh. <laughs> where, oh, shoot, where did I freeze up? Uh, just, just towards the end of describing him um, meeting up with, with a woman, and I, we probably oh, shouldn't yeah, say yeah. anymore, before they shut yeah, down the no, feed. Fine. They probably have drones yeah, overhead. Yeah. 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 yeah so, um, I mean, she becomes like this weird part in his life, and there is sort of an ambiguous supernatural element. Okay. I, okay. I'm not I am playing with another trope, but I'm not going to say what it is. There, there is an, another novel out there after that. Is that going to be your book about sharks? Because we know you love Jaws. Yeah. We know there's a shark book in you somewhere at some point. When are we getting the shark book? I don't know. I would love to. Um, that or a, like a, somehow a giant monster novel. I have no idea what the other novel is. Um, I don't have to worry about that for a little while. So we'll see. <laughs> so, um, it's been observed over the last few years that horror film and fiction are experiencing kind of a, a commercial boom and a popularity unseen since the Ronald Reagan presidency. Um, why do you think, and you kind of addressed this earlier, but why do you think people turn to horror in times of political, civil, economic, environmental upheaval? What is it that draws us back to horror in droves when things feel um, so uncertain? Um. That's a good question. I mean, because that's almost sort of like the, the old saw, you know, uh, that's sort of like conventional wisdom, I guess, would be like, oh, in these, you know, in these times, you know, I think in the 80s, when, um, you know, Reaganism and conservatism were, was really the oppressive sort of cultural majority attitude that people, you know, rebelled against, you know, being, <laughs> you know, buttoned up like that. 
you know, for lack of a better phrase. So I think maybe some of the, some is where some of that is where that came from. Now I don't know. I think it's just so different. I mean, it's hard to discount like the history of pop culture before the last twenty years because I think you know there were so many Gen X writers, people our age, you know, who grew up in the eighties, and this is you know we consume that stuff. So now we're we're making it. Um, so I think it's re it's really sort of I don't think it's apples to apples comparing those times in some way because I think you know just what the monster that culture uh, popular culture has become, um, and even how splintered it is. I mean there's so many different pockets of fandom. Like, you know, even though like we're seeing more, you know, it feels like we're seeing more horror published now, certainly compared to the nineties or maybe the early two thousands, but it's not being published or consumed at the level it was in the eighties. I mean, in the eighties, we were throwing down, throwing around million dollar deals and selling, you know, 600,000 copies of books left and right. You know, I mean, that, that's not happening, uh, you know, which is fine, but I do think we are seeing, um, I don't know, a wider representation of the genre, hopefully, you know, more own voices, you know, we need to continue to see that, which I think are all good things. You know, why is it happening? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think it's a confluence of like scary times plus, you know, there is a little bit of a less stigma attached to genre than it used to be. I mean, it's still there, but yeah, I don't know. I'm just glad people are buying my books. Please keep buying them. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, whenever people try to compare it to the 80s boom though, I always think of, this anecdote Robert McCammon told about the time he was uh, driving along and he was on Hollywood Boulevard and he didn't even know in advance that they were going to buy a billboard on Hollywood Boulevard for one of his books, just announcing a book. Right. And uh, uh, I thought to myself, well, they, they were moving capital around a little bit different behind horror paperbacks back then, you know? Um, yeah, no, and there'd be like full page ads in newspapers. I mean, also newspapers, you know, in magazines. Um, you know, so it's just, it's different. Yeah, it'll never be the 80s again, which is probably a good thing. It's okay. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the heavily romanticized era, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, that, that does it for my, my questions I had for you. Um, okay. You have um, to... Yeah, before we go to the q and I, I want you, can we talk just a little bit about The Loop, like maybe describe what it is? Because I, I would just say to everybody, Jeremy's novel, The Loop, which come, comes out September? September 29th. Yep. September 29th. Um, is not a YA novel. <laughs> even though it features, uh, you know, teenagers or high schoolers, uh, protagonists. Um, man, like everything Jeremy does, it's so wild. It's so, it's so imaginative and propulsive. Like, I feel like I'm going to be denigrating it by saying, and maybe that's not fair, but like, there's like, there's like Michael Crichton sort of parts, like the best parts of Michael Crichton, but Jeremy's characters are so real and so lived in compared to like Crichton's wooden characters. And so I don't know, I was blown away by both like the science of the book which I made me a little bit afraid, like how much you know, but also just the characters are amazing as well. So anyway, everyone pre-order his book. Maybe Jeremy can do a better job of telling us about the loop a little bit. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm not going to argue. It is. There's another book out there called <laughs> The Loop right now by a guy called Ben Oliver, which also is a YA book, uh, which ah. may be causing part of the confusion in the marketplace. Uh, it's like a dystopian future for teenagers kind of thing. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's uh, The Loop by me. Um, the Loop's <laughs> <laughs> it's the one, the one with all the lightning bolts, the one that they gave yeah. the uh, thriller cover to. So, um, yeah, yeah, 63 days, man. It's exciting. Um, I'm going to try and minority report my way into the Q&A here. All right. Let's see. Oh, no. Okay, Todd Clark wants to know, did the feedback about the ambiguous endings from earlier novels in any way influence your decision to have a finite novel on Survivor Song? No, the feedback, no. Um, but uh, like I said earlier, it's more just like, I, I know I, I don't want to be a one trick pony. I don't want to do the same thing every time. I want it to be different. Like, you know, this next book, The Paul Bearers Club is, is certainly not going to be like, I don't know, I feel like the last two books have somewhat of a thrill structure and move quickly. I mean, this book is going to be, you know, much more of a like take its time, almost character study, you know, so it's going to be a lot slower before it gets to maybe some of the pyrotechnics. So, um, no, like, <laughs> I, I asked my friend John Langan the other night, like joking, like, when do, like, how old do I have to be before I can be like the cantankerous old writer, like 65, where I can say shit like, 
you know, people who don't <laughs> like the ending of Cabin of the World are, are just very smart readers. I was a, a totally hypothetical question. I, I did, I'm not saying that publicly. Um, no. So listen, with the ambiguous stuff, like it, it has to be there for a reason to me. It has to represent like the horror of the whole story. Like to me, the horror of the cabin at the end of the world is, you know, you know, is it an apocalypse happening daily or is it not? Like, we don't know. I mean, we're in the, maybe we're in the middle of one, you know, that, maybe that's how apocalypses work. You know, so to me, that was the core, you know, part of the core of the novel. What choice would Andrew and Eric make? That was the story. Um, yeah. So at the very least, I feel like I can, you know, I have to be able to explain why ambiguity is there to myself. And if I can't, then it doesn't go in. All right, let's queue up another one. <laughs> this one comes from Maggie B and I'm paraphrasing, but she noted that most of your novels come from the perspective of women. Uh, what draws you to that perspective? Um, I don't know. Jeez, that's a hard question. Um, I, I try to really make the story, make the choice. Like, for example, in A Head Full of Ghosts, you know, I really wanted to, on some level, comment on the stereotype of possession stories, where it's, you know, usually young girls possessed and sexualized, etc. So I was like, okay, they... It has to be from these two sisters' point of view. Um, you know, and Survivor Song started with a what if that sort of determined what, <laughs> you know, one of my main characters was going to be an eight and a half months old pregnant woman. Um, you know, and, it, and it's, and again, instead of doing the family thing, although I guess there is, you know, event, maybe a family thing later, um, or pre-family because she's pregnant. It's not, you know, parents yet. Like I want to do a friendship sort of story. Um, so that was sort of like how it became Natalie and Ramona. So I always try to make, I always try to have the story, whatever I think it's gonna to be to help make all the important decisions. Like everything has to serve the story. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's just, you know, sometimes I just get sick of, you know, some of it might be like that. Like with disappearance, I wanna do a single mom instead of a single dad. Cause I was like, well, I don't know. Maybe I'm sick of, male protagonists all the time. I just wanted to, you know, have the single mom. Yeah. Uh, right. Bubble my way through that question. <laughs> the giant finger is scaring me. So this is from Troy Arsenian. Um, and Troy is wondering, obviously you wrote the book prior to 2020. Do you feel like the actuality of what we're all living in now has helped or hindered the book in its effectiveness, in its reach? Um, um geez, I don't know. I mean, it is weird. Like, I, I definitely have a, a weird relationship with this book now, you know, mainly because my sister, Erin, who's one of my best friends, and you know, she's only 11 months younger than me. Um, we've lived near each other our whole lives. You know, I mentioned she's a nurse at a big city hospital in Boston. She was really instrumental in the research that I did in this book, particularly all the stuff that related to the hospital response, et cetera. Um, you know, there's a text exchange that I quote in Survivor Song that's from, that my sister essentially gave me from her and her nurses when they were freaking out when the hospital wasn't going to do a very good job with uh, preparing for the Ebola outbreak that had happened in 2014. So that, that became sort of like a pre, unfortunately for her, a preview of what's happening now. Like that's where the PPE reference comes from in the book, et cetera. So I don't know, this book in, in my head is so wrapped up with 2020. It's wrapped up with my worries for my sister and for everybody. Um, so it's strange. Like, you know, it is, it is also weird to me that like so very, very few people have read this book before coronavirus happened, even though it was written before it, the first review copies were printed in like December. Um, you know, just as a thought exercise, it'd be like, geez, you know, I wonder what the book would read like without, <laughs> without 2020, but I'll never know. Um, sales wise, I don't know. I mean, I've heard from some like fans or I've seen some fans say, oh, I love Paul's work, but I just can't read a book like that right now. And I totally get it. So I don't know if 
maybe that's hindered sales, who knows. Got all stuff beyond my control, I try not to worry about it. Um, but this is a good question. I, I have heard from people who have, um, you know, who read it, obviously everybody who's read it pretty much has read it in this context, who, who yeah. actually uh, found that kind of uh, uh, catharsis and comfort in seeing someone else experience something that feels so out of control in our own daily lives. It, it was, it, it's weird that it would be in any way a kind of psychological comfort food to see anybody else going through such a similar situation, you know, minus the, you know, giant attack wolves with rabies, you know, the animals yeah. obviously escalate the, the threat uh, in your yeah. situation. But, but that's been a, an interesting thing to watch is, is people going the full opposite direction and, and finding comfort in the story, you know? Yeah, no, it is. I mean, that has been cool. I'm glad, I'm very happy that people who have read it that have connect, you know, found hope that way is great. And I would even say weirdly for me, like the, the ending, the prelude before 2020 felt a lot more horrific to me than it does now. Like the prelude to me in the context of 2020 feels a lot more hopeful than it yeah. did when I wrote it in you know 2019 without saying too much. Here we go. Oop. All right, this one comes from Christopher DeFonzo. Are you an optimist or a pessimist? Oh, um, and eh, pessimist. But I try to be an optimist. <laughs> um, I, I'm sure most families like think this way or joke this way, but it's especially true with my brother, who I'm very close with as well. Um, especially when it comes to stupid stuff like sports, like we always try to do the reverse trembly jinx. Like we're gonna say, oh yeah, you know, this, they're gonna they're gonna get smoked. They have no chance. You know, when the team wins, we're like, ah yeah, you know. So it's never like, oh yeah, they're definitely gonna win. We always always say, no, they're gonna lose. So I don't know. It's hard not to to think in those terms. Um, I don't know. Probably mostly pessimist, but I try I try for optimism. I do. All right, let's see. Okay, here's one I'm not sure if you can answer, but I am sure you have been asked before, and I just want to see what you're going to say, because I'm, I'm always curious. This is from Melba Mack. Was Marjorie possessed? <laughs> I'll never tell. This, no, this is the never. one time. It's a scoop. No, never tell. No, no. Uh, an adjacent question to that is, like, I get asked a lot, like, do you have, like, the real ending to A Head Full of Ghosts or, like, Cabin at the End of the World? Or what, what's wrong? <laughs> a real ending. That, I, well, no, yeah. no, no, no. Like, I mean, I like, do you, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like, the, I, the, I mean, do you have, like, what the true, it should be, what's the true interpretation? That's why I, I guess what I meant. To those novels. You know, I feel like Disappearance of the Devil's Rock sort of answers. I think there's an answer to Disappearance of the Devil's Rock. Yeah. I think there's words on that paper that the reader figures out at the end. Um, and honestly, but it changes with each story. So with The Head Full of Ghosts, I utterly divorce myself from thinking, you know, there's a true interpretation. To me, the horror of the novel is the ambiguity, the fact that we don't know, and how that mirrors our everyday life or everyday existence even our identity and memory like things change we, we, things are a lot less sure than we think they are um and with cabinet in the world you know it's slightly different approach instead of like divorcing myself from thinking there was something supernatural not supernatural i have a side that i'm rooting for i will say that in cabinet in the world i'm even though i tried to build the cases equally i'm rooting for one side over the other but ultimately it doesn't matter to me. And I've never thought one nanosecond beyond the last line of the book about those. I've never thought about what happens one nanosecond beyond the last line. Um, so, sorry. Sorry, Melva, but at least I gave you a long answer. <laughs> Poor Marjorie. Oh, um, this is the question I totally forgot. And I normally would always ask it, but Ted Wilson, Straight out of Telluride wants to know, what can you tell us about film adaptations of your work across the board? So Head Full of Ghosts is really close. Um, 
um, you know, they have a director, they've got an act, you know, Scott Cooper, they have a screenplay, uh, they have Margaret Qualley to play adult Mary. They even have some like foreign financial distribution money. So it's a matter of um, our country being less on fire <laughs> uh, with the pandemic and then finding a time to start shooting. Maybe in the fall, you know, hopefully knock on wood, we'll see. Um, but yeah, there, it sounds like they're essentially just ready to go and just, you know, need to be able to physically be able to, <laughs> excuse me, to, to film. With uh, Cabin at the End of the World, it's been optioned. I really can't say anything else beyond that. Um, I've had some fun conversations about Survivor Song, but it has not been, hasn't been optioned yet. It's being pitched, as I'm told. Pitches are fun. Every time my first phone call with the Hollywood person, well, no, that's not true. My first phone call to talk about Cabin at the End of the World. I won't say the producer's name, but it was a big production company. So right off the bat, I was like, why do you care about Cabin? It could be made for like a hundred grand, you know? I get on the phone and he says, hey, dude, <laughs> I want to be in the Paul Tremblay business. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> You're in that business. <laughs> Yeah, and he hadn't, he hadn't read the whole, at that point, the book was only 50 pages in a summary, and he hadn't read the whole thing. He, he's like, you hadn't read 50 pages in a summary? He says, I'm good at guessing where things are going, right? Like, okay, where's it going? He's like, there's going to be time travel, right? <laughs> no, there's no time travel. <laughs> well, so, in a better book, Paul. I mean, he had, yeah. he had a peg. If I had actually written an ending, there would have been time travel. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let's see. Finger of fate. Going for more questions. This is from Melody Torres. If you could pair four movies with your books, which would you pair? Oh boy. Um, well, I mean, you mentioned Disappearance of Devil's Rock is almost to me the most film connected book. And you mentioned the three movies, uh, Picnic and Hanging Rock, Lake Mungo and Snowtown Murders, three Australian movies. Um, but The Head Full of Ghosts, I mean, there's so many different references to possession movies and horror movies in general. But I will say I, I would pair reading that book with watching Take Shelter, which is one of my favorite movies. Like, I wish I wrote that story. In fact, I know it didn't make a lot of money, but if they want to offer me the novelization of Take Shelter, I'm there. I will do the novelization of Take Shelter. Um, Oh, survivor song? I don't know. I can't think of a good um, zombie or zombie adjacent pairing. Uh, other than, I don't know, Night of the Living Dead. I love Night of the Living Dead. It's still such a great movie. That's all I got. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Need a haircut. What do you think? Yes? No? It's been since late February. One's from Matthew Henshaw. What, is there a time where a reader has had a theory or perceived something in, in your work uh, that you hadn't necessarily intended for them to see there or, or where they made you realize something else about your work? Like they, they saw something in there that made you think they were actually onto something and you may have accidentally writ, written more about that than you thought. Yeah, all the time. Um, I'll never forget the first time it happened was with A Little Sleep, which is my narcoleptic private detective novel, which I guess plug, William Morrow is going to uh, re-release those books in early 2021, which is cool. Um, so that novel plays with the narco, you know, so a narcoleptic private detective, he's not a very good detective. You know, so he falls asleep and a lot of the book is sort of his weird dreams. But I had someone, you know, one of the first one of the first big festivals I'd ever gone to, like super nervous, my first novel. This guy raises his hands like, oh, in the tradition of the crime novel, there's always, you know, the, the detective or character gets like hit on the head, knocked out, and then the next chapter starts. And that's such a trope. It's like, I love how you played with that, it, you know, with your, with your detective always, you know, going conscious and unconscious. I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, for more recently, I would say with the head full of ghosts, there, there's a lot of readers who have, uh, of a interpretation, which I think is a brilliant interpretation. Like they, they can 
certainly make the argument in the, within the text that this happens, that I did not anticipate people would do, which is cool because part of what I tried to do with that book was instead of building ambiguity by withholding information, I wanted to build ambiguity by giving out like just a data crush of information, right? You just get bombarded with all these different data points. And again, I mean, that sort of reflects how we live. We're just bombarded with all this crap, what's true, what's not true. You know, so that there's a lot of readers who have this interpretation, I don't wanna say what it is, but you know, this interpretation of, of the book, which I think is amazingly cool. But you know, when I was writing it, I, I, I didn't necessarily focus on that possible interpretation. All right. And that's why ambiguity is fun, right, people? Come on. <laughs> Has the pandemic motivated you or hindered you in your work? Oh, I hindered, um, like everybody, I think. I mean, I mean, it goes sort of in waves, like, you know, there was nothing getting done in, in March and even like through early April. Um, although I, I had sort of started the outline of the Paul Bears Club and, you know, what helped me was you know, my agent was having a child in, Mar in May and like, you know, the realization that, you know, my, he makes money only if I sell books and, you know, and, you know, same thing as my publisher, the only, you know, editor and publicist, they make money if we sell books. So in my own head, I was like, okay, I'm going to write this because, you know, I'm a part of this group. I'm part of this team. You know, I want to, you know, we got to keep it going. So that was helpful to get me, to force me to do some writing in like April and May, you know, and then I started getting going a little bit, but then again, like every, most everybody else, you know, with the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, you know, June was a total wash. I was just watching news and you know, I mentioned, you know, taking my daughter to some protests. And um, so it's weird. I, I hate to say I want to say, we're, again, used to the new normal because I'm not. I'm still like everybody else, just super anxious and, you know, watching the news and probably spending too much time online. But at the same time, you know, trying to find a way into writing. It, it, I won't say, I, well, maybe I am enjoying writing this a little bit. It's still very hard to write, but I will say it is a little bit of a relief to when I do sit down to write. And if I ha happen to lose myself for like 30 minutes is what I'm doing. It is a nice little break <laughs> from reality. All right. I think we're almost through Q&A. Right. So let me check. This is from Sean and Jessica, and they are wondering if you could choose any one director to make a film of any one of your books, what would be that ideal pairing? Well, well one is I'm friends with Alejandro Brujes. I, he's probably gonna yell at me if I'm saying his name wrong. Uh, he did One of the Dead, which is a great movie. He's, um, he had one of the first segments of Nightmare Cinema, if anyone's seen that. He did, um, you know, he did Puka 2 for Hulu, which was a horror comedy. Um, I don't know, I'd love to work with Alejandro. He's a really smart guy, really good screenwriter. He, he's helped me with some early attempts at screenwriting. Um, you know, other than that, I don't know, is it, you know, I mentioned Take Shelter, Jeff Nichols would be amazing, I think. Um, Jennifer Kent, The Babadook is like one of my favorite stories, I think. What I love about The Babadook is how honest the story is and she is about like some of the dark thoughts that parents have so it'd be amazing if i could put her you know have her do one of one of my books that involve like you know a parent in some way um so so there's there's a little list that's a that's a great list <laughs> know, let's see um Well, there's, there's an anonymous attendee asking if I can say anything more about the loop or read from the intro, which I'm guessing is that's got to be my mom. <laughs> so, but uh, uh, no, uh, uh, actually, I, we're getting ready to ramp that up and I'll be back here at Powell's on October 9th, uh, reading straight from the book and, and uh, be talking a lot more about it in the next uh, next couple months as publicity ramps up. Um, yeah, let me ask you really quickly, though. What? Um... Like what came first, like the what if of sort of like the 
you know, the science of the story or was it the, the high school kids? Like what was sort of the spark of, of the book? Um, in, in this case, it was definitely the, um, the high school kids. Uh, mm -hmm. I was being asked for a novel. I had no idea. I felt like I'd, I'd completely run through my idea bank kind of, uh, I had nothing in the trunk. And my wife bought me a, um, a gift certificate to go to this place called Float On that sensory deprivation tanks. And so I told myself beforehand, I was like, I know, I'm, I'm, I meditated yeah. on the idea. I was like, you're gonna hand me a novel brain somewhere in there that you got, you got something for me. And I went and I did this hour long float and about three quarters of the way through the float, uh, I started to see all these green stars uh, and I felt like I was lifting up through the universe and I saw the stars started swirling around and then they uh, formed a name and the name was Lucia. And so I tried to figure out who Lucia was, what that meant. And so it was very much like a character oriented generation. Um, and then I read an article about, uh, it was some Wall Street Journal article about some more kind of, um, you know, altered technology and um, physical integration of technology and the challenges there with getting it to be accepted into the body and the people at the forefront of that. Uh, and so those two things, uh, just the idea of Lucia and the idea of, of uh, you know, biotechnology. And then also the fact that I, of all the uh, pain in my life that I hadn't mined, uh, my teenage years and my coming of age in a small town, I hadn't tapped into that yet. And so, uh, so I was like, well, I guess this is that time. Um, and so that's, that's, it was a weird genesis. Um, a yeah, weird book. <laughs> with the, with the, but the, yeah, the deprivation tank, definitely. Uh, can I ask you one more question? Since Ted Wilson from Telluride was asked earlier, uh, will you ever do the pig's roast eyeball shot again? Oh, okay. So I did it again last year. And this is, a, uh, this is a shot they do at a bar at this festival called The Grindhouse that is a barbecued pig's eyeball and uh, rum 151 and porchata and like just something else awful. I, they just thought that if they put all the awful things in one shot, it would be the part of this ritual. Um, and so sometimes the guests do it. I did it one year and it went fine. Last year, um, I did it and there's this guy named Eric 6465 next to me and I looked over and I see him start gagging and uh, and I started gagging and I kind of like projectile sprayed some porchata, oh. some flaming rum 151 out through my fingers. Uh, but I held the rest down, so I was proud. So I'm, at, I'm now a two-timer. I've effectively blinded one barbecued pig. But uh, I, I may not go back into that trench. I'm, it's, it's real dicey. It's real disgusting. Um, but uh, maybe if you go. <laughs> yeah, I'll go, but I won't do that. I know. We, just saw, we just saw our list of participants just start all quitting. That, that, this all right, part so of the hold on. I've been in, I think there's one more in here. Um, Okay, th actually, this is a really interesting one. This is from Stephen Drum. I think it's a good one to close on. Okay. If you were going to veer wildly out of genre, uh, what kind of form or genre would you choose to tell a story in next? Um, huh, that's a great question. Um, I've been sort of itching to do like a comedic novel. I don't know, but in some ways, I think that's sort of close to horror because horror and, and comedy, to me, I feel like they're just different sides of the coin. They're like, you can react to life absurdities either in horror or just, or by satire, by laughing at them. Um, I think that would be it, I think. Or I don't know, or maybe like a fictionalized sports biography, like I am a sports fan. Uh, David Peace, who's a British crime writer that I really like, has done some like football books, like British soccer books, you know, that I've read and like, wow, these are like really cool. Um, I mean, that's totally very far back burner. I mean, I do love basketball and I've coached it forever at the school I teach at, but Stephen Graham Jones has already beat me to fictionalizing, fictionalizing <laughs> some basketball scenes twice. Yeah. He did it, he did it in um, Leadfeather and he did it with his new novel, The Only Good Indians, which I would highly recommend. So, yeah, I guess comedy or sports, if I were to, to veer out. All right, you heard that, Willie Morrow. That second <laughs> novel. Yeah. Paul's big sports comedy coming in hot. <laughs> the next slap shot. Brace yourself. Oh, boy. Awesome. Um, 
yeah, I think I think that does it for our Q and A. Thank you to everybody for coming, Paul. Thank you so much for yeah, answering a ton of questions. That was awesome. Thank um, you, Jeremy. And uh, thank you to Pals for having us too. Oh, you're muted. You're muted. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry. Yeah, I just want to say thank you to you both. It was an honor to welcome you. Thanks for everyone to tune in, for tuning in tonight. If you haven't already done so, go over to pals.com, pick up a copy of Survivor Song. You can pre-order The Loop or see Jeremy back here in October. Uh, while you're at the website, check out all the events we have coming up. Feel free to register. I hope to see you guys all again soon. Paul, Jeremy, thanks again. Thank thanks. you. Hey, everybody. Bye, everybody.